Thank you everyone for coming. So we're going to get started. Um, we're doing something very unique here today because we are celebrating and saluting the World War II era in an actual World War II town. And we have some very special guests with us here today. We have some actual World War II veterans and I'm going to introduce them briefly. And when I call your name, if you could just raise your hand or stand, whatever you prefer. And if you could just hold your applause until I finish. First, we have Mr. Peter Caggiano, who repaired P-47s in Europe. We have Marianne Gowman Finn, who is an actual Rosie the Riveter in the Kaiser Richmond shipyards and took fabricated ship parts to the right Liberty ship. Staff Sergeant Bob Hitchcock, who rode, was a top gunner on B-17s and also B-24s as a signal scrambler through 32 missions over Europe. Mr. Warren Jensen, he was an artiller in the artillery, operated eight-inch howitzers, landed D-Day plus 10 in Normandy, moved through the hedgerows, spent winter in the Ardennes during the Battle of the Bulge. Corporal Joe Amata, he was, he was a Marine Field Artillery crewman, marksman, rifle, saw action in Okinawa and Raikou Islands, and participated in the occupation of China and Japan. Mr. John McBride, trained pilots, and worked in counterintelligence. Mr. Bill Fanrude, Where's Bill? Navy Flyer in the Pacific. And I believe there were two other, uh, um, husband and wife came in and I didn't catch their names. Um, husband says he outranks the wife. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is a, an event that's being put on by three groups. The Benicia State Parks Association, the California State Parks System, and the Bay Area Women's and Men's Historic Representation Society. And we're going to begin now by having a few words of welcome from Carol Berman, president of the Benicia State Parks Association. Thank you all for coming. Uh, again, Carol Berman, President of the Venetian State Parks Association. And it just warmed my heart to see you all inside this building and having a good time. Um, we're here for the 71st anniversary of the end of the war in Europe. And uh, we're here to celebrate peace. Um, it was the end of the war. And we all probably have some relation to what happened during that time, whether it was a father, a grandfather, a great-grandfather, um, an aunt, an uncle, a uh, grandmother who may have, may have been in that situation. So thank you all for coming. And um, as a footnote, we're going to do um, sort of a reverse. On June 6th, we're doing um, D-Day, so the declaration of war. Um, and we'll be doing that here, but in a more intimate setting, and we'll be having a fireside chat with gentlemen such as Bob Hitchcock and Peter. Um, and that's on June 6th, we'll be doing that here as well, put on by the Benicia State Parks Association in affiliation with all the volunteers who are here today. I'm gonna thank them because these things would not happen if it weren't for the, the volunteers who did this. Um, and Donnell didn't mention herself as one of those people who organized it, but she is the event organizer. And she did a tremendous job on this event today. So, thank you. Thank you, Carol. Now, I would like to introduce the Contra Solano Sector Superintendent for the California State Parks, and he's the new man in charge for Benicia State Park, Mr. Ryan Goring.
Thank you. I'd like to welcome everybody today to this great event. Here again, I want to acknowledge all the veterans, uh, not only the World War II veterans, but also any other veterans that are here today. Please raise your hand if you're a veteran. Applause. Thank you for your service. So again, I would like to welcome uh, or acknowledge the great support we have here with events such as these with the uh, Benicia State Park Association. They're a huge supporter of our, uh, the, Bene uh, the Benicia Capital State Historic Park and also the Benicia State Recreation Area here in Benicia. Without them, we would um, really be struggling. So, And then also I wanna thank our, again, all of our volunteers, our VIPP volunteers and our staff that, that help out with this event and events such as these and, and keep the, the, the grounds going here. Um, acknowledge the Bay Area Women's, Men's, and Historical Repre Representation Society here for this event. It's uh, great to see everyone, and uh, there's some participants as well that have dressed up for the occasion, so it's great to see everyone in these awesome outfits that are here for today's event. And again, I'd like to acknowledge Danelle Bay. She's uh, been very instrumental in planning this event, and um, she's planned many events here in the past, and She's a great supporter of the park and, and really excited to hold events like these for the public. Um, it's just great to have events like this in the, in the park. We had events such as these in the past, so it's a, a very small portion in time um, that we're celebrating here, but they had events such as these in this facility. So it's great to see us using this facility uh, in, in representing history of California and also of, of the United States. So. Again, thank you all for coming, and I'll turn it back to you now. Thank you. So now it's time for our fashion show, and this will be conducted by Sherry Oliver of Yesteryear Sierra. Sherry has many years of experience with historic fashion and is past president of the Art Deco Society. And what you're going to see is not just a fashion show, but she will give you background and context for the fashions, tailored specifically to Venetia during World War II. Sherry? Thank you, Donnell. How oh, nice. Well, here we are in, what is it, 1940. We are celebrating the 1940s. And really, the 1940s got a wonderful start here in the Bay Area with our World's Fair on Treasure Island. Let me get this a little bit closer since I don't have my glasses. And also, it's really hard to turn pages with gloves on, but I couldn't resist wearing these gloves with this dress. Can you believe it? <laughs> well, that's the kind of thing we did in the 40s. You'll find out all about accessorizing and how important that is. Again, as the decade of the 1940s opened, life in the San Francisco Bay Area was pretty sweet. In 1940, the San Francisco World's Fair on Treasure Island was a great success, providing jobs, tourism, and excitement to a populace still recovering from the Depression. The World's Fair promoted the idea of progress and cooperation among the countries of the Pacific, even though war was raging in Europe and Asia. Americans wanted to stay out of it. Roads and other infrastructure that had been improved for the expected fair visitors and cars were becoming affordable to middle class families. So people from Venetia and other suburban areas were able to visit San Francisco for shopping, dining, shows, and dancing. This carefree life came to an end on Sunday, December 7, 1941. Like a bolt out of the blue came the news from Hawaii. Pearl Harbor had been bombed, taking out most of the Pacific fleet. From radios, from newsboys, from neighbors, from announcers in dark and movie theaters, the news spread and a sense of dread settled over the country. The very next morning, December 8th, President Franklin D. Roosevelt went to Congress and got a declaration of war, unanimous except for the name of ultra-pacifist Jeanette Rankin of Montana. Germany, as Japan's ally, immediately declared war on us. President Roosevelt spoke to all of America that night, calling December 7th a date which will live in infamy. 
Instantly, America was on a war footing. War plans were made. The FBI immediately rounded up 4,000 suspected spies and saboteurs. 4,000 they'd been keeping an eye on. Factories were retooled to switch focus from civilian to military uses. Car makers switched to tanks. Lipstick tube makers started making ammunition shells. Same thing, right? <laughs> With a mighty push, America went from a depression-ridden wreck to the hard-working, full-speed-ahead machine that powered the arsenal of democracy. Crossing the Bay Bridge, you could still see the buildings of the fair, but now those buildings were used for military storage and training. The Bay Area was a focal point of the Pacific War in our effort against Japan. This is the story of the people behind that effort, many of them from right here in Venetia. Many people pulled together to help provide victory to our beloved country and friends and allies who valued freedom and democracy. People poured in from, for the war work. Some 240,000 built and repaired ships in Vallejo, Richmond, Oakland, and San Francisco. The converted Richmond Ford, Com Mo <laughs> Richmond Ford Motor Company prepared tanks for shipment overseas to the Pacific War. And the Venetia Arsenal, right here, manufacture the munitions for those and other weapons. Prior to 1942, the Venetia Arsenal employed just 85 civilian employees. In the 24 hours following the Pearl Harbor bombing, 125 separate truck convoys, not 125 trucks, 125 convoys were loaded and dispatched from the Venetia Arsenal, leaving its stock of ammunition, small arms, and high explosives completely exhausted. At the factory, the men who had been assembly workers had to decide whether to enlist in the service of their choice or wait until the draft came along to make the choice for them. One of these men was Richard Duck Sullivan, not Dick, but Duck, who played piano for the Venetia USO on Saturdays. Duck, come on up here, please. We're calling him Richard the Riveter. Duck Sullivan, factory worker, is wearing denim coveralls, worn over a chambray work shirt and khaki pants. An aluminum helmet, made by B.F. McDonald Company in LA. A technical innovation on the eve of the war, light and protective, this was the most common helmet worn at Kaiser Shipworks. One drawback later learned of resulted in its demise, aluminum conducts electricity. Uh-oh. He's also wearing a horsehide jacket with a half-belted half back. This is popular with ship workers since horsehide is rugged and resistant to tears and abrasions, and stylish, too, for after-shift bar and honky talk hopping. He's also weather, wearing uh, leather work boots and carrying a tin lunchbox. Yeah, don't want to miss that. And he has an original Kaiser Shipyard's worker's ID badge with a very scary picture. <laughs> but before the men left, they had to train their replacement workers. Where were these workers to come from? Uncle Sam put out the word, we need women. <laughs> Moviegoers were treated to the sight of Katherine Hepburn in her signature trousers and a welding mask, appealing to the women in the audience to sign up, and they did, in droves. By October 1942, payroll at the arsenal had reached 4,545. Remember, this is up from 85 civilian employees before Pearl Harbor. That's pretty amazing. A New York Post magazine cover by Norman Rockwell showed the new heroine, strong and muscular, in her mannish pants and shirt, her hair tied back with a kerchief. She was dubbed Rosie the Riveter. There was even a song about her. I looked it up. All day long, whether rain or shine, she's a part of the assembly line. She's making history, working for victory. Rosie the Riveter. <laughs> Marianne Finn. Marianne had enrolled.
enrolled in UC Berkeley when Pearl Harbor happened. At the age of 18, she began work in the Kaiser Shipyard in Richmond as a warehouse clerk. Marianne was in charge of keeping track of freight, engines, turbines, smokestacks, as they were brought into the yard, then ensuring that the freight was delivered to the proper job site, often riding the train with the freight herself. Her job also involved making thousands of purchase orders, freight packing slips, and bills of lading. Gas was rationed then, so the commute to and from work was by car pool. Lunch was brought in a bag or a tin lunchbox. The women workers were close. All had her own hero fighting in the war over the world. And the women were there for their men and for each other, if and when that fateful telegram was delivered. Official job attire consisted of a pair of oversized overalls, check, steel-toed safety boots, and hair wrapped in a bandana beneath a hard hat, plus a badge with photo ID. A special perk for the women was the chance to attend ship launchings. At these events, the women could dress up a bit, perhaps a new scarf, earrings, or a hanky in the pocket. Our Rosie is also wearing, let up, what else? Let's see. Oh, I guess that's about it. She's got her work boots, she's got her kerchief, she's got her ID badge, and note, few women were really riveters. It wasn't really Rosie the Riveter because they got rid of a lot of rivets in favor of welding, which was a better uh, way of putting the ship together. So uh, arc welding was a fairly new technology, so it eliminated a lot of the riveters, so maybe we should call her Wendy the Welder. <laughs> Thank you. Henry Kaiser's Liberty Ships were the result of his approach to shipbuilding as a construction project. By super organizing the workplace, labeling parts clearly, and training many people to do one thing well, Kaiser was able to reduce the waiting time for a new ship from five months to two weeks. They had housing provided by Kaiser, daycare, and they started a prepaid medical plan for their workers, today's Kaiser Permanente Healthcare. During the war, the Kaiser Bay Area shipyards built 747 ships, still a record. The new roles for women included other war work, including not only manufacturing jobs, but any job that could be done by a woman to free up a man for combat. Administrative, communications, and intelligence tasks were taken over by women in both civilian enterprise and the military. One interesting job title was computer. And for that, we have Mary Anna Johnson. Now, Mary Anna Johnson graduated from Venetia High School in 1936 and attended the University of California at Berkeley, where she majored in chemistry. After graduation, she was one of four women hired by the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, NACA, the predecessor of today's NASA, to work at Moffett Federal Airfield in Mountain View, California. This is where the most powerful wind tunnels, up to 570 miles per hour, were helping to engineer the best aircraft possible for our forces. Mariana's first job with the NACA was as a computer, computing data from the wind tunnel tests on new aircraft designs. Intelligent, well-educated women were hired to work through computations, the math behind which was quite complex. And remember, these calculations were done without modern-day computers or even calculators. Later, many of these women became the first computer programmers. Now, Mary Ann is wearing what we always have called a little black dress. Over that, she's wearing a lab coat with, of course, a, an ID badge. You don't get into Moffitt without an ID badge. She's at work in the wind lab, taking readings to work on later. The look in the 1940s was skimpy, shortish skirts just below the knee with a close-fitting silhouette. This look was appropriate for the new wartime reality of work and rationing. Her most memorable wartime experience, Mariana, was her way back from training trip to Washington, D.C. in January 1942, when she was bumped from her flight by a group of airmen and Hollywood actress Carol Lombard. Carol had just finished a bond sales campaign and was anxious to get home to her handsome husband, Clark Gable. Mm -hmm. Don't blame her. She never made it. The plane crashed outside Las Vegas with all hands lost. 
Marianne took a later flight and arrived home safely. Thank you, Marianne. Intelligence was an important activity, as enemy surveillance and code breaking were crucial to keeping the home front safe. We don't realize how scary it was for people back then, before satellites and instant communication helped to clear up the fog of war. Blackouts were called for in coastal cities and more. Why? Because there were submarines lurking along both coasts, and they used that backlight to help them target ships. A Japanese sub-based aircraft tried to bomb Seattle. Swimmers in Florida saw a merchant ship exploded right in front of their face by a torpedo. German subs entered New York Harbor and attacked ships attempting to get war material to Europe, with shipping info gleaned by spies disguised as waterfront workers and other innocuous characters. In New York, four German Americans, one a US citizen, were executed as enemy agents and another was arrested right here at the Richmond Kaiser shipyard after trying to start a warehouse fire. So you see, there was danger on the American home front. As spies tried to be inconspicuous, so did counter spies. Like our friend coming up, Tom Early. You never knew who might be wearing that dapper downtown suit. He could be a businessman or somebody like Tom Early who was assistant to OSS Chief Bill Donovan. OSS, Office of Special Services, was a predecessor to the CIA. Thanks to men like Tom, we were kept pretty safe. He's wearing a three-piece dark gray suit with a white shirt, a blue with red geometric pattern tie, white pocket square, gray hat, and plain black wig wingtips. Oh, he was so disappointed. This is about as drab and inconspicuous an outfit as you can get. And that's what you wanted to be able to, to just blend right in. Rationing went into effect as soon as they could print up the coupons and get the bureaucracy up and running. Wool cloth for suits like this was one of the most closely rationed items. The wool was needed for soldiers' uniforms. So you got coupons for a certain number of yards of fabric per year, and the merchant worked with what you had. That is, when the merchant could get anything. Shortages were even worse than coupons. Some things you just could not get for the duration, as they said back then, for the duration of the war. Leather shoes were also rationed. People were advised in official publications, as well as newspapers and magazines, to take care of their clothes and make them last. And I might add that. Our friend Tom has a very special item that he got from his boss, the OSS, and that is his watch. Yes, way ahead of Dick Tracy, he has a two-way wristwatch. Thank you, Tom. Now, some men in important uh, war exempt occupations were wearing civilian suits out on the street, but the greater percentage of men that you see or hear during World War II were men in uniform. The great thing about uniforms is that they convey a lot of information in one glance. Everything about a uniform tells you something, from the basic color, which tells you the country and department of service, to the patches and pins that indicate branch, such as infantry or artillery, and perhaps most of all, the stripes and insignia that indicate rank. Rank is very important in the service because if you don't salute a superior officer and a rank above you, you will be in big trouble. We'll be pointing out these identifying features on this outfit. Representing Lieutenant Colonel William Jones Hamlin of Venetia, Army Air Corps was raised right here next door, growing up in the Fisher Hanlon House, which is now part of the Venetian Capital State Historic Park. Two of his sisters, Catherine and Raphaelita, were the last owners of the house and donated to the state of California. Lieutenant Colonel Hanlon was a life member of the Army Air Corps, having started as a flyer in World War I. In 1941, 
Hanlon was not the commanding officer at is what is now the Keesler Air Force Base in Mississippi, the training base that produced the Tuskegee Airmen. He spent 30 years in the Army Air Corps and only retired from it in 1947 when it became the Air Force. Well, here he is in a United States Army Air Corps uniform dating from between July 1937 and March 1942. So, it's a uniform that would have been in use on Pearl Harbor Day in December 41. The Army Air Corps uniform is just like the Army's except for the identifying insignia. This type of uniform comprising tunic and trousers in two colors of wool was often called pinks and greens. The trousers were made in light shade drab, a pinkish beige. The jacket or tunic and olive drab supplies the green, hence pinks and greens, an often used slang term for officers' class A uniforms. Identifying insignia for the Air Corps include the U.S. Army Air Corps shoulder patch. This is one that was used before 1942. It's known as the pinwheel patch, and you'll find it on the left shoulder of the tunic. This is the patch that was in use on that December 7th date. Once war was declared on Japan, changes were put in the works for uniforms of the U.S. Army. Changes announced in March 1942. The pinwheel patch was replaced by a U.S. Army Air Corps Headquarter Wing Star patch, a blue round with a pair of yellow wings over a white star with a red dot in the middle. We'll see plenty of those a little later. The Sam Brown belt, was eliminated and replaced with a cloth belt matching the tunic. The white shirt and black tie were dropped for a tan tie-in shirt, if you're pinks, or olive drab tie-in shirt for your greens. So this uniform is really of that moment. The silver and gold winged propeller pins on his lower lapels and the pilot's wing pin above the pocket are also identifying insignia of the Air Corps. His rank, Lieutenant Colonel, is indicated by the wings pin, which is specific for a base commander of that rank. And silver oak leaves on his epaulets, those straps that go along the shoulder from neck to shoulder seam, sleeve seam. There are the usual US cutout pins on his upper lapels. The three chevrons on the left sleeve indicate one and a half year service overseas during World War I. You got one for every six months of service. The ribbon bar is for service in World War I. Remember, Bill Hanlon got his start as a pilot in 1917. The visor cap is a standard bar for Army officers at the time and continued in the 1950s. The distinctive insignia, or DI, pin on the shoulder, designates which precise group the officer served in, and there were thousands. This particular one is for the 21st Airship Group of Scott Field, Illinois. This distinctive insignia pin is the hardest to match for, for collectors when you're trying to put a uniform together because there were so many units over the war years and it's very hard to get the precise one. So I'm sorry, Lieutenant Colonel Hanlon, we don't have the one for Keesler Air Force Base, but everything else is as it would have been worn. Thank you, Lieutenant Colonel. Douglas G. Phillips reported to the mine layer USS Ramsey on December 6, 1941. He remembered well his first morning aboard December 7th. It was a beautiful one. He had breakfast and went on deck to enjoy the Hawaii scenery. He'd been out less than five minutes when he noticed planes coming over. Oh my God, they were Japanese planes. They were lined up to torpedo the battleship Utah, which was right next to the Ramsey. A spy had sent a map to Tokyo, showing the location of the ships in Pearl Harbor so they could target efficiently. But what the Japs didn't know was that the Utah was just a shell being used as a target vessel for bomber practice. Well, it rolled over very quickly. By 0800, the Ramsey had steam up and was running anti-sub patterns at the harbor entrance. When they saw a periscope, they threw a smoke bomb to mark its place and then dropped depth charges using sonar to guide them. By 10 o'clock, the Japanese had finished their job on 
were heading north to their carriers. The Ramsey started rescue and cleanup operations. When his crew saw the damage to Pearl Harbor, none of them had the heart to go ashore for liberty. This Navy officer's uniform is made of wool and, of course, navy blue, consisting of trousers and jacket. Not a tunic, but a jacket. The jacket is double-breasted with the Navy's golden eagle buttons. His rank of captain is indicated by the four gold stripes on the end of the sleeves. Above the stripes is a silver star of a line officer on the fighting line versus a supply or technical support unit. His white cap sports the Navy badge with a U.S. shield and eagle backed by cross anchors. The black patent leather brim has gold oak leaves which denote higher officers, lieutenant commander and above, and sometimes were reverently called scrambled eggs. Thank you very much, Captain Phillips. In 1943, Captain Clyde Green of the U.S. Army Ordnance Department was assigned as a U.S. Army Inspector Officer for a new facility in Venetia. The Yuba Mining Manufacturing Company was reorganized to assist the war effort. Instead of producing dredging equipment for gold mining, it began producing howitzers. The howitzer plant, like the arsenal which it was near, operated 24 hours a day, seven days a week throughout World War II. The Yuba Company facility was the only commercial plant making the 15, excuse me, 155 millimeter howitzer, a medium-sized artillery piece with a short barrel, much used during the war. The plant fully cooperated with the U.S. Army and was awarded an E-flag for efficiency in production and quality of labor. Many of the Venetia-produced howitzers were shipped overseas to all three combat areas, including North, America, North Africa, France, and the South Pacific. This is a World War II Army Youth Officer's Uniform. The rank is captain, indicated by two silver bars on the shoulder. The field Branch insignia pins on the lapels figure two crossed field guns. The uniform has a light blue forage or shoulder braid. The blue color is reserved for the infantry. So you can immediately tell between the crossed guns and the blue on the shoulder that he's infantry. If he were artillery, that shoulder, pack, shoulder braid would be red. If he were cavalry, no horses anymore in World War II, tanks it would be yellow. So every little thing on the uniform tells you something about the person wearing it. In 1922, 15 companies of Philippine scouts were established. These units were composed primarily of Filipino enlisted men and U.S. officers and manned many of the coast defenses in the Philippines until 1942 when the Japanese took the islands and imprisoned the Allied soldiers. Battle of Corregidor and the Bataan Death March are the still remembered names of that time and that hell. General Douglas MacArthur promised in 1942, I shall return. And he did that in 1944 when the U.S. recaptured the Philippines. The island nation gained its independence in 1946, right after the war. Thank you. and earned an engineering degree from MIT. This gave him an intimate understanding of aviation from both sides as designer and flyer of aircraft. His special skills were put to the test in 1942. After terrible U.S. defeats at Pearl Harbor in the Philippines, Doolittle suggested a mission to turn things around, a secret strike on the Japanese mainland. April 1st, 1942, was a grand day for the Bay Area, because now, ready at last, our new fleet of ships could pour down the straits 
into the bay and out through the Golden Gate with Lieutenant Colonel Jimmy Doolittle and his raiders bound for Tokyo aboard the USS Hornet. 16 B-25 medium bombers with targets to Tokyo and beyond. Now these were full-size bombers, not the kind normally used with carriers. On the morning of April 20th, radio programming was interrupted for an announcement by President Roosevelt. Americans steeled themselves for more bad news. Instead, in a gleeful voice, FDR announced the Tokyo strike. He said that they took off from Shangri-La and hit Tokyo. So they couldn't figure out where we were really coming from. Ha ha. It was a major morale-building victory for the United States. Although the damage done to Japanese war industry was minor, the raid showed the Japanese that their homeland was vulnerable to air attack and forced them to withdraw several frontline fighter units for homeland defense. The success of the Doolittle mission was the first good news we had in the Pacific and a precursor to the decisive victory at Midway later that year. Here is a working pilot that might have been on the Doolittle raid. He's wearing an olive green flight suit underneath all that stuff, with shirt and tie, Army, Air Force, and Captain's insignia on the collar. He's got a leather flight helmet with goggles, a heavy shearling jacket to keep out the cold at high altitudes, a shoulder holster with a 45 pistol, an oxygen mask, yep, and a map in his pocket. They didn't have GPS then. He's also wearing what they called a May West, common nickname for the first inflatable life preserver, which was invented in 1928 by Peter Marcus. It was called the May West after the well endowed little movie star, because someone wearing the inflated life preserver suddenly became very big up top. <laughs> During the Second World War, U.S. Army Air Forces and Royal Air Force servicemen were issued inflatable May West as part of their flight gear. Air crew members whose lives were saved by the use of the May West were automatic members in the Goldfish Club. They spent some time in the water, I suppose. He's also got something that no one wanted to be without in World War II, his lucky strikes. Yeah, life was tough, and you needed a break every now and then, something to pick you up. So he's got those. And it was a way of establishing communication and bonding between the men in the war. He's going to actually offer a cigarette to someone around here. Robert Hitchcock of the nation for over 40 years, who was a second cousin of Jimmy Doolittle.
Finally, the ship's wreckage was spotted on August 2nd, and soon after that, the men were rescued. Bray had spent 140 hours in the water. Of the ship's 1,197 men, 317 were rescued. That means 880 of them died. But Harold Bray got his revenge when on August 6th, the atomic bomb, Little Boy, using some of the components brought by the Indiana, was unleashed on Japan. After the war, Harold Bray remembered the Bay Area and moved to Venetia. So he's another Venetia person in our show today. Navy blues is what this guy's wearing. Navy blues, yes, you see them on the Cracker Jack box. They've been around since there was a U.S. Navy, even before the United States was founded, only became official in 1794. It was modified some before World War I, but basically it's changed little through today, except for the cheaper materials, of course, that they use now. Ratings for rank and duty are sewn on the sleeve. For example, petty officer, engine room, etc. Very simple and very useful. Thank you, Stephen Bray. Our next model is not representing one person. He is emblematic of thousands of our fighting men in World War II. He's dressed in his working gear. And let's just call him Kilroy, as in Kilroy was here. And I'm going to ask him to tell you all the stuff that he's got hanging from him. Kevin? Alright, so yeah, basically everything I'm, I'm wearing is the uh, uh, basic instrument is combat gear. Uh, <clears throat> when you talk about the infantry, you talk about guys just stripping down to what you need, that's all, if, just to survive. So I've just got my basic uniform, got the uh, combat belt where you carry all your ammunition, the cartridge belt. Uh, in your pack, you carry some ra extra rations, a blanket, just so that you know, if you're out for more than a couple of days, you can curl up and keep warm. Uh, extra ammunition, you've got your helmet, you've got your rifle, the M1 Grand rifle, which was uh, one of the more, most common rifles uh, issued to the uh, U.S. Army. Uh, I've got the uh, it, it was described as looking like a pineapple tree, just the, the pineapple grenade. The early grenades were actually painted yellow. This one was recovered from Italy, uh, having been dropped in 1940, late 1944. So that's where they talk about pineapple grenades because they're yellow. Uh, but uh, basically, this is what an average instrument would be wearing and carrying throughout the war, uh, primarily in the European theater. Great. Thank you, Kip. She said, 
You have taken off silk and put on khaki, all because you have a debt and a date. A debt to democracy and a date with destiny. This young lady, our whack, is wearing an enlisted uniform, light colored khaki with long sleeve shirt, tie, jacket, and skirt, and a flat cap. It is a regulation summer enlisted personnel uniform. It has the U.S. insignia on the right lapel and the special WAC insignia on the left. This depicted the helmeted head of Pallas Athena in gold, the Greek goddess of wisdom, victory, and crafts to symbolize the work and purpose of the WAC. It was chosen to delineate the Women's Corps from the regular army with its warlike symbols such as cross cannons and flaming bombs. Her rank is first sergeant, three up and three down with a diamond shape in the middle. Her DI pin indicates this patch, excuse me, indicates a seventh service command, a behind the scenes supply command group. And you'll see that on her shoulder. Notice the uh, stockings and the very sensible shoes. The regulation was no higher than two inches, which sounds pretty high to me. <laughs> and gloves with it. Thank you very much. Now we have some nurses. On the home front and on the battle line, a steady stream of wounded men drove a huge demand for nurses. Long considered a female appropriate occupation, nursing standards advanced during the war as necessity pushed medical care to be faster, more effective, and better organized than ever before. From Red Cross volunteers to the military's professional nursing corps, nurses were crucial to the war. The Army Nurses Corps enlisted fewer than 1,000 worldwide on its rolls on 7 December 1941. Only 82 Army nurses were stationed in Hawaii that day. Six months later, there were 12,000 nurses on duty in the Army Nurse Corps. Few of them had previous military experience, so they had a training program for them. Eventually, more than 59,000 American nurses served in the Army Nurse Corps during World War II. Nurses were working closer to the front lines than ever before. Within the chain of evacuation established by the Army Medical Department during the war, nurses served under fire in field hospitals and evacuation hospitals, on hospital trains and hospital ships, and as flight nurses on medical transport planes. The skill and dedication of these nurses contributed to the extremely low post-injury mortality rate among American military forces in the war. Overall, Fewer than 4%, 4% of American soldiers who received medical care in the field or underwent evacuation died from wounds or disease. So these ladies saved a lot of lives. The chief nurse at Hickam Field, Hawaii, First Lieutenant Annie G. Fox, was the first Army nurse to receive the Purple Heart. Although unwounded, Lieutenant Fox received her medal for her fine example of calmness, courage and leadership, which was a great benefit to the morale of all she came in contact with. The citation exemplified the nurse's contribution to World War II. Here we have a standard Army Nurses Corps service uniform. This dark olive drab uniform jacket and skirt was available in winter and summer weight material. This is the winter uniform, made of 14 and a half ounce wool twill with a surface that is lightly pebbled or ribbed. As an alternative, women could also wear this skirt in light shade drab or pinks. So they could be pinks and greens too. The rest of the uniform consists of a dark olive drab garrison cap with gold black piping, a cotton shirt waist of khaki broadcloth, matching khaki tie and long Oxford style shoes, and sensible heels worn with cotton stockings. Yes, oh, well, they really clean, don't they? <laughs> Her rank of first lieutenant is shown by the single silver bar on her cap and on each shoulder of the jacket. As part of the Army Medical Service Corps, she wears an insignia on both jacket lapels of a winged caduceus with two entwined snakes and a superimposed letter N for nursing. Of course, the usual cut-out U.S. letters are worn on both sides of the collar. 
Each dark gold stripe on the lower left sleeve of the jacket indicates, again, a six-month period of serving overseas. So thank you very much, Lieutenant Annie Fox. I really should have a martini glass up here instead of that plastic. Next time. Eleanor Roosevelt was upset, as she often was. And as she often did, she rattled some cages in Washington with her question. Why did the Navy not have a female component like that of the WAC in the Army? So Congress, in July 1942, authorized the WAVES, an acronym for Women Accepted for Voluntary Emergency Service. But I don't think they were ever called anything but WAVES. <laughs> Appointed as director of the WAVES with the rank of lieutenant commander was Mildred McAfee, who had been president of Wellesley College. McAfee quickly built a new service of 1,000 officers and 10,000 enlisted women, despite taunts from the brass and media, who enjoyed asking her if the waves would want matching underwear. Perhaps fashion questions were not completely out of bounds, since the waves officer's uniform was beautifully designed by the famous designer Mainbacher, and therefore was a major recruiting perk. This is a Navy wave enlisted uniform. Skirt and jacket in navy blue wool with black eagle buttons. The officers had gold ones. The jacket had a four button, thank you. <laughs> the jacket had a four button front and, and the collars had rounded endings with pink lapels. On the lapels, you notice the wave insignia, a white foul anchor, which is an anchor with a rope around it, in front of a blue propeller. The jacket had two pocket flaps outside, but the real pockets were inside. And she's wearing a six gore skirt with two inset pockets at the front. Now, some jobs required the use of slacks, which were introduced for waves in February 1943. She's also wearing a white cotton collar shirt, black silk tie, and white gloves, all of which were appropriate for dress occasions. Daily wear called for a blue shirt and tie and black gloves. She's topped with a navy blue garrison cap, which has a navy wave insignia on it. Rank is second class petty officer, or CPO. CPOs could wear a special cap device, which consisted of a fouled anchor in gold, the letters USN and silver metal superimposed. So here is our wave. Beautiful. They really knew how to tailor back then, didn't they? You notice how well these uniforms fit. And uh, that was, that was uh, partially of design and partially the pride of the individuals wearing them, who would go and have them tailored so that they looked good. Women at home. Women who were homemakers were reminded that they too were part of the war effort. Saving strain, tinfoil, and rubber bands, donating to paper drives, Growing victory gardens and buying war bonds were patriotic activities. Volunteering for the USO and wartime committees made their days busy. Women's magazines abounded with stories about soldiers and articles about ways to economize, even posters aimed at getting the kids to help on the home front team. And don't forget that scrap that fat. Yes, your bacon fat on the, on the oven there can help be used as animal grease. Who would have thought that? Thrifty use of food, clothing, and gasoline was mandated by the use of rationing coupons. Since all our efforts were toward the, the war, such crucial resources were sent to the services first. So even with coupons, many items were not available in the stores anymore. Under such circumstances, going shopping was more a chore than a pleasure. For example, a well-known young lady in Venetia, Jane Pasalacqua, had to wear a brown suit for her way. Silk and satin was neither available nor practical. For shopping in Venetia or taking a bus to nearby Vallejo, casual clothes would do. But for a trip to San Francisco, dress up. And here we have Jane all dressed up to go downtown. A good wool coat was a major investment during the war. It was worth it to buy good quality fabric because it would last longer. 
This lovely coat of maroon wool is paired with black accessories, gloves, purse, hat, shoes. Put together, it creates an ensemble, a look. Changing the accessories helps to change the look. So even if you had to keep the same coat for the duration, you could freshen it up then every time you wore it. What a lovely hat. It has a veil in front. Oh, it's just so charming. Thank you, my dad. It came over the media, radio, newspapers, magazines, billboards, everything talked about the war and what you could do to help win it. The military presence was everywhere. Damaged ships plied the bay going towards the naval shipyards in Vallejo. Servicemen on leave and defense workers and ship changed thronged the streets and housing was tight. The population had quadrupled in two years. Thousands thronged the military bases Thousands jammed the hospitals for medical help, but thousands more came to paint the town. Many a night would see a brave little group go to the top of the mark, that's the top of the Mark Hopkins Hotel in San Francisco, to see off their loved ones, sons, husbands, brothers, sweethearts. One last dance, one last kiss, and then away. And later, you could see a ship steaming towards the Golden Gate. Think of him know that he was looking up at the lights of the city, thinking of you. And say a prayer, the first of many, that he'll come home. Mary Anna Johnson, remember our computer? Mary Anna Johnson in her white lab coat? Well, she has thrown off the work coat and is now transformed for a cocktail party with glamorous accessories. Hats and costume jewelry were not rationed. So this is where the woman could splurge on style. Hats during this time got very silly, creative, and charming. Flowers, feathers, turbans, and veils were all popular. Hats were not worn for formal evening occasions, a dinner or a ball, for example, but hats for the cocktail hour were ubiquitous. As it turns out, her black dress had a touch of chartreuse hidden under the lab coat. She's added a black jacket and accessories with red and chartreuse to go out on the town. Her hat sports feathers in red and chartreuse, and she's got a red giant poppy on there for her memory of her loved one, and wonderful chartreuse gloves, just plain. Women's hair back then was usually rolled in front for a pompadour look, and usually shoulder length and loose or put up and back. Eye makeup was usually fairly understated, but lips were red. If you had no other makeup on, you put on some lipstick. And they didn't have pink yet, and they sure didn't have purple. It was red. So thank you for that. Other, uh, oh gosh, here we are. Jane, Jane, are you ready? Good. Here's Jane again changed out of her coat and shopping clothes for a cocktail at the mark. This cocktail ensemble shows a fashion trend of the resource-conscious warriors, the skirted blouse worn as evening wear. The black Georgette meat-length cocktail skirt could go with just about anything for dozens of different looks. They made the same skirt in a longer length for later in the evening. The bodice of black Georgette and lace embroidered and sequined in a red floral pattern for a very striking and feminine look. Speaking of feminine, how about that flirty little doll hat? It's black sequins with feathers, very small, and tipped over one eye for that rakish look. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. They're going over the window to watch for their men. Now, our other uniforms that we've shown you today have all been service and undress uniforms. Now I'd like to bring up a really nice, full, formal dress uniform. This is Commander C.M. Shaw, U.S. Navy. He served in the U.S. Navy Medical Corps from 1918 through World War II. 
and more several important articles, including one about treating influenza during the great epidemic of 1918, and another in 43 about treating leg fractures. He might have served at Oakland's Oak Knoll Hospital, a former resort, and known for its swanky officers club and golf course. His uniform is a naval officer's evening dress uniform, which would have been worn on formal occasions, for example, a visit to the White House, or entertaining a foreign dignitary, or at a ball. The navy blue jacket has long tails, like a men's formal jacket would, and his trousers are trimmed in gold braid. He's wearing a white PK waistcoat, waistcoat, white stiff front shirt, a green collar, and black tie, a black bow tie. On the sleeves are the three equal gold stripes of the commander and an oak leaf to designate the U.S. Navy Medical Corps. On the bill of the cap are oak leaves designed for commanders and captains. On the buttons, the American Eagle faces left because this uniform is pre-World War II. No new evening dress formal uniforms were made during the war, so anything you find from before then should have those left-facing eagles on the buttons. Cap covers could be either navy blue for winter or white for summer, and swords, although part of a formal uniform, were left at home with this particular uniform. Shortly after the war began, naval officers were no longer required to own this splendid uniform, and it was never returned to service but he has brought it out for this special occasion, watching the men steaming through the Golden Gate. There they go. Now we are getting to 1944. The Allies decided on a Europe first strategy and landed in France on D-Day. June 6, 1944. On May 8, 1945, less than a year later, Germany surrendered unconditionally to the Allies. Victory in Europe, what we call VE Day, was celebrated throughout the world. In the United Kingdom, where Bob Hitchcock was, more than one million people celebrated in the streets to mark the end of the European part of the war. But here in the United States, the victory was bittersweet. President Franklin D. Roosevelt had died of cerebral hemorrhage less than a month earlier, on 12 April. So flags were still at half mast, and we knew there was a big job to be finished in the Pacific. On August 8, to avoid a costly invasion of the Japanese islands, an atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. Thousands were killed, and the city was leveled. When that didn't move the Japanese leaders, Another atomic bomb was sent to Nagasaki on the 12th. Finally, on August 15th, Japan signed its unconditional surrender. It was publicly announced on September 2nd, VJ Day. Now, at last, the war was over. Our men were coming home, ship after ship of them, all laden with soldiers oh so welcome. Parochial parades and parties and grand victory dance to celebrate. And that's what I'd like to talk about right now, having all of our models come back up for our victory celebration. As I call the models up, let me first thank Backstage Help, Laurel Martinez and Jennifer O'Neill. Thank you.